Again, what is your name, please? My name is Frank William Abagnale. Number two. My name is Frank William Abagnale. And number three. My name is Frank William Abagnale. Greetings, everybody. Maximus here. So you just saw the most famous airline pilot imposter in history, Frank Abagnale Jr. back in 1977 on a game show called To Tell the Truth, a task which Frank wasn't very good at. But for those too young to remember, the goal of the game show was for a contestant who may have done or achieved something amazing to tell their story. But the catch was, there were two other contestants who were put there simply to lie and try and get the judges to fall for their story, trying to fool them as to the actual identity of the person. There was always two liars and one person telling the truth. Thus, the name of the show, To Tell the Truth. However, on this day, for the one and maybe only time in the history of the show, maybe all three contestants were lying. Because until that time, the world had only one way to verify Frank Abagnale's fanciful stories. And that was from Frank himself. Because of course back then there were no computers or Google or search engines or smartphones or social media. That technology was still decades off in the future. But back in the days before technology there was only one way to go viral. And that was to get on television. And that's exactly what Frank Abagnale did. And after just that one game show appearance, it was like Frank Abagnale was shot out of a cannon. Eventually ending up on the closest thing to YouTube of the day in 1978, and that was getting on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Once Abagnale sat with the most powerful man in Hollywood, Johnny Carson, Abagnale's ticket to immortal fame was punched forever. After that, he became the first social media influencer in history. Then in 1980, Frank wrote a book about his life, recalling his time pretending to be a pilot, a doctor, and a lawyer, among other professions, all while cashing millions in bad checks all around the world. And it was then, all the way back in 1980, that a young filmmaker secured the rights to his book titled Catch Me If You Can. And that filmmaker, of course, was a young Steven Spielberg. However, it took Spielberg another 22 years to make the movie, until it finally debuted in 2002. But I'm sure many, if not all of you, already knew that because you've probably already seen the award-winning movie. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, let me know why down below in the comment section. But there was just one problem Frank never foresaw. Well, a big problem, actually. And that was the invention of a little thing we all now call the internet. Because you see now, with the power of the internet having the benefit of thousands of years of information suddenly at our fingertips, it became possible to attempt to verify all of Frank Abagnale's fantastic tales and fantasies. And what all that information revealed was that Frank's biggest con of all, well, other than fooling Steven Spielberg, may have been the fact that his biggest con was that most of his stories were just that. Stories. It was all one big con job about a con job that Frank carried on throughout his life and built into a multi-million dollar career. But now, one man has done the work and found the receipts to prove that all of Abagnale's scams have been, well, scams. In 2020, author Alan C. Logan released a book after years of researching Frank Abagnale Jr. And what he uncovered proves that Abagnale's biggest con of all was that his life story was mostly a fictional invention of his own making. And I'm going to tell you exactly how writer Alan Logan exposed Abagnale. But first, let's tell Frank's story his way. And then I'll tell you how none of what he said happened could have possibly happened when he said it happened. Frank says as an only child at the age of 16 in the 10th grade, his parents divorced after 22 years of marriage. But instead of choosing which parent he wanted to live with after the divorce, Frank just ran out of the court and pulled a Forrest Gump and just kept running. He said he never saw his father again who died a few years later in a slip and fall accident at New York's Grand Central Station. And he said he didn't reunite with his mother until seven years later when he was 24. Frank said he ran to New York City and immediately began to look for work. 
He said he then changed his driver's license to make himself 10 years older, which was easy to do because unlike babyface Leonardo DiCaprio, Frank was a big tall 16 year old with already graying hair. Soon, according to Frank, he got the fake Pan Am pilot uniform and the fake ID badge. Then he went to the hobby shop to get the model airplanes to use the Pan Am decal logos to make fake IDs and fake payroll checks that he would cash all around the world. According to Frank, he says that Pan Am estimates that between the ages of 16 and 18, he flew more than a million miles for free, boarding more than 260 commercial flights in 26 countries around the world. Then after he was finished pretending to be a pilot, he found his way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he passed the bar exam and became a lawyer, then a doctor, and a professor before going to France where he was eventually arrested and spent time in jail in France and Sweden before he was deported back to the US where he eventually went to work for the FBI. So that's Frank's story in a nutshell. Okay, now for the cold hard facts that author Alan C. Logan dug up. In reality, Frank's parents divorced when he was 14, not 16. And Frank wasn't an only child, he had three siblings. In fact, his father actually remarried rather quickly and Frank did see his father again because he lived with him for two years. But Frank started shoplifting at an early age and when he was 15, he perpetrated his first con on his own father, Frank Sr. In addition to a bank account with plenty of blank checks, Frank's dad had given him his own gas card and a truck to help him commute to his part-time job. But Junior quickly ran up his father's gas card to $3,400, which is $33,000 in today's money. Frank would go on to use his dad's credit card to buy a ton of auto parts and then return them to different stores for cash. After Frank got busted for the gas card thefts, his mother sent him away to boarding school. However, that didn't last long. It was at this point that Frank, when he turned 16, ran away. And Frank did change his driver's license birth date, but he didn't go to New York to pose as a Pan Am pilot. Instead, he joined the Navy between 1964 and 1965, but soon got booted from the Navy. After the Navy, Frank stole a Mustang and took the blank checks his father gave him and drove from New York to Eureka, California. But as soon as Frank got to California, he immediately tried to pass a bad check at a local bank in Eureka. However, the bank promptly called the police and Frank got busted yet again. But still, Frank's poor forgiving father, who Frank says he never saw again, flew to California to bring his son back to New York. Due to his father's poor financial situation, the judge took mercy on him and only charged $1 for bail. Two weeks after Frank got back to New York, the Tuckahoe police arrested him for stealing blank checks from the service station where he rang up all those phony credit card bills. And there he began a three-year prison sentence at the Great Meadow Prison in Comstock, New York. Which at this point completely debunks his whole 16-year-old world-traveling sexy pilot impersonation story. But wait, there's more. So then Frank gets early parole in 1967. However, he is then quickly arrested in Boston on grand theft auto and check fraud charges. There he goes to jail in Boston for four months. After the four months in jail in Boston, he is returned to prison in New York because of his parole violation to serve his full sentence where he gets out of prison in 1969, where at this point he is 20 years old. So at 20 years old in 1969, he is released from jail and literally days later, he scams a TWA Airlines pilot uniform, not a Pan Am. However, he does fly to New York posing as a TWA pilot sitting on the jump seat. And that's where he meets flight attendant Paula Parks. And as we'll come to find out, it was really Paula Parks that blew this case wide open. So then, for the next few weeks, Frank basically stalks Paula trying to get a date with her. He would always just happen to show up in every city she flew to and just happen to meet her at the airport there. Paula had no idea how Frank knew her schedule. Paula said it was really freaking her out. But Paula said she finally told Frank, I don't want to date you, and she thought he got the message. However, after she got back to her apartment in New Orleans, guess who comes knocking on the door? That's right, stalker Frank Abagnale Jr. So Paula finally comes out and tells Frank, look dude, I am just not that into you. As a matter of fact, she said, I'm on my way to Baton Rouge to see my parents. And Frank said, great, I'll drive you. 
Wow, stock much, Frank? But Frank was still charming and persistent, plus Frank had a sweet new giant Chevy Impala convertible. Finally, Paula gave in and said, okay, fine, you can drive me. That way, Paula figured the long drive would be a good way to finally get it into Frank's thick head that she was not interested in him. But once at Paula's parents' house, Abigail really pours on the charm and hits it off with her parents. But Paula tells them she wants nothing to do with him. Still, her parents really like Frank Jr. So Paula's mom invites Frank to come back to Baton Rouge sometime for fishing lessons. After that, Paula thought that was the last she'd see of Frank and they all went their separate ways. Now Paula was finally relieved because she didn't hear back from Frank. But days later, Frank shows up back in Baton Rouge at Paula's parents' house to take them up on those fishing lessons. Well, one thing leads to another and Frank charmed them so much that they invited him to move in with them, even giving him his own key to their house. So now Paula's mother is cooking and cleaning for Frank like the son she never had. That's when Frank tells them that he lost his job with Delta Airlines due to being furloughed and he was looking for a job. So of course Frank ended up staying with Paula's family for quite a while. After having successfully wined and dined her parents, they came to trust him, even though Parks herself didn't. While he was staying in her family home, even sleeping in her old bedroom, she was rightfully mortified and refused to see her parents as long as Frank lived there. Still, her parents continued cooking and cleaning for him and introducing him to people in Baton Rouge. But while Frank took them out to dinners, whining and dining them as a thank you, it was later revealed that he was doing this with checks he was stealing from them. In the book, Logan claims that Abagnale stole about $1,200 from the Parks family. That's equivalent to about $12,000 today. And he bounced even more checks from local businesses in Baton Rouge. This, of course, is a huge contradiction to Abagnale's version of the story. In Abagnale's autobiography, he claims that he never ripped off individuals, only corporations such as hotels, airlines, and banks. Well, now you know that wasn't the truth at all. It was at this point that a family friend, a local reverend, got suspicious and called Delta to see if Frank really worked there. And of course, they told the reverend the whole story that Frank was just a con man and never was a pilot for Delta or any airline. So the reverend called the local sheriff and dropped the dime on Frank. So Frank was arrested by Baton Rouge police on February 14, 1969 for passing bad checks and stealing checks from Paula's father's checkbook and buying them gifts with their own money. Convicted in June of 1969, Frank was sentenced to 12 years in prison. However, the reverend that turned him in had mercy on him and convinced the judge to sentence him to probation and psychological treatments and restitution instead of 12 years hard time at Louisiana's toughest prison at Angola. But of course, Abagnale didn't stick around to get his treatments and took off once again. So this is where he went to live in France and got busted again for ripping off two friendly families and went to jail in Sweden as well for Grand Theft Auto. After two months in a Swedish jail, he was deported back to the U.S. in June of 1970. Then it's in the late summer of 1970 when he is 22, not 16, as he says in his autobiography, that he finally gets the Pan Am uniform. It wasn't until the late summer of 1970 when he made the Pan Am paychecks. But unlike his claim of thousands of checks worth millions of dollars, it was really only about 10 checks worth about 1200 bucks. But the genius that he is cashed these checks in his own name as First Officer Frank Abagnale. He cashed the first one in July in North Carolina, but then he spaced them out. First in Dallas, then Houston, Tucson, and California. Then eventually in Provo, Utah, he got sloppy cashing checks all over town. After the Provo checks bounce, the FBI starts looking for him. Ten checks finally made their way back to Pan Am. And this is the entire basis of the Catch Me If You Can Steven Spielberg movie. On November 2, 1970, Frank is arrested yet again and pleaded guilty to the Pan Am checks and was sentenced to 10 years. Claims he escaped Atlanta Federal Penitentiary never happened because he was never at that prison. But he was in Georgia's Cobb County Jail where he did escape in February of 71, only to get rearrested trying to cash another Pan Am check again. He was transferred back to the Fulton County Jail to serve a four-year sentence 
and gets paroled in February of 1974. Oh, and as far as the FBI is concerned, the FBI refuses to acknowledge that Abagnale ever worked for them. Oh, and finally, his story that was featured prominently in the film, that he escaped through the airplane toilet after he was brought back to the U.S. Well, that was such a pile of crap, you could fill an airplane toilet with it. After the movie came out, aviation engineers said that it's totally impossible to escape through a commercial aircraft toilet. Frank finally had to stop telling that part of the story and admitted it was a creation of Steven Spielberg for the movie. And of course, it never happened. But now you can see the real Frank Abagnale, who claimed to be an innocent runaway and never preyed on the little people and only stole from large corporations, was a complete con. Yet his lies enabled him to build a multi-million dollar data security company and make millions from giving speeches all around the world where he continues to peddle the same now proven lies until this very day. The name of the book is The Greatest Hoax on Earth, Catching Truth While We Can. Written by Alan C. Logan. It's a great read. You can find it on Amazon. So now, what do you think about Frank Abagnale's tall tales? Once a con man, always a con man, I guess. Well, that's going to wrap it up for now. I can't wait to read all your comments down below. Has your image of Frank Abagnale changed? Let me know down below. And on your way out, please don't forget to like because that's what gets the algorithm excited to spread this video to wider and newer audiences. And please subscribe and ring the bell so you can be notified whenever we release new content. Oh yeah, and remember, leave the rubber on the runway and your troubles on the ground. And I will see you next time in the air. Yeah, this is Maximus.